Won't be long now, Captain. Engines running well, check should only take another 20 minutes, 25 tops. Thanks, Chief. Also, let me know when you're ready to repair the window. That sheet in my quarters, it's like having a terrible blue screen. Aye, sir. Commander Jep. No. Captain Gemini's log. Stardate 1418.8. I've been giving Commander the Vindicator ahead of schedule as we're rushing the final prep work to get the ship ready for hyperspace travel. Captain Thomas Eagle's final transmission from the Columbus was ominous at best and terrifying at worst. He mentioned extraordinarily powerful ships which looked, quote, black as night. This entire situation is reminiscent of the events of an old DOS game I played in my youth called Star Control 2. It makes me wonder if the game itself was actually like a warning of some kind, what may come when we finally venture out into the stars. So since that game's highly requested, and help cool my nerves, and because there's nothing left for me to do until the ship's ready to get on our way, I think it's high time we finally took a look at this game. So here we go. Ancient DOS Games Episode 200. Before we continue, I feel I need to address something extremely significant about my own experience with Star Control 2. See, I'm actually terrible at this game. Well, don't get me wrong, this isn't a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, nor is it really all that difficult, and I'm more than capable of acing some pretty tough games out there, plus I know exactly how to play this thing. But for some reason, despite any of this, this game just absolutely destroys me when I try to play through it. I actually do have a few theories as to why, which I'll go into, but if it seems as though I'm mostly showing stuff from the early game and very little of the late game, well, that's why. But yeah, Star Control 2 is actually a very decent and often highly praised game about exploring space, collecting resources, forming alliances with alien races, and real-time combat. Actually, an interesting piece of irony is that the battle engine in this game is virtually identical to the one found in the original Star Control, but Star Control's battle system was layered into a strategy game which people just generally didn't enjoy all that much, whereas here, it's been woven into a sort of Starflight clone. And let's not mince words here, the basic fundamental gameplay in Star Control 2 in terms of communicating with alien races, exploring planets for resources, acquiring mysterious artifacts, and having to do all of this on a time limit before some cataclysmic event takes place, is all lifted from the original Starflight. However, most people don't refer to Star Control 2 as a Starflight clone, and the reason is because the game deviates enough in terms of presentation and has so much personality of its own that it's able to stand on its own merits, and that's what ultimately keeps a game from being referred to as a clone in the first place. Star Control 2 is brimming with personality from the large array of alien encounters, and all of the dialogue, even with other humans, typically has a layer of humor thrown in. The game never takes itself too seriously, and that's part of its charm. And given the mechanics behind the ships of some of the races you encounter, taking them seriously is virtually impossible to begin with. I mean, come on, the Spathy in this game have butt missiles. Butt missiles! Star Control 2 was developed by Toys for Bob and originally published by Accolade around the end of 1992. While the main game is a one-player action-slash-simulation game, a special Super Melee executable is also included, which allows for two-player combat with all of the game's standard ships, or even zero players, allowing for matches to be simulated with the AI exclusively. 
The game utilizes MCGA 320x200 256 color graphics and supports a slew of audio devices, all producing digitized sound and music. In fact, when I read that the Windows sound system was supported, I actually had to look that up because I didn't think WSS was that old. But yeah, turns out it debuted right around the same time as this game, so this could actually be one of the first games which supported it. Still, for emulating in DOSBox, using Sound Blaster support is the simplest approach. As for its current release state, well, this is where things get interesting. The game is in a quasi-state of being both commercial and freeware. See, here's the weird thing about this game's licensing situation. A very large number of years back, large amounts of the Star Control source and assets were made freeware, so that fans of the game could pick it up and port it, and thus have this game live on. But there was a catch. They couldn't use the Star Control name, as it was still under trademark, and even to this day, it still is. Furthermore, what fans were given as freeware content was from the 3DO port of the game, not the original DOS version, which does have some minor differences to the DOS version, though the most major difference is that the 3DO port had voice work, whereas the DOS version doesn't. So here's how it works nowadays. If you want the original DOS version, it's still commercial and can be obtained as a digital download from www.gog.com, where it comes with the original Star Control as well for $6. However, for the most part, the only reason you would want to do this is for sake of nostalgia. Or because you want the original Star Control 2. Well, not Star Control 2, the original Star Control, you guys know what I mean. The freeware port of the 3DO version of Star Control 2 was retitled simply The Urquan Masters, and can be obtained from its homepage on SourceForge at sc2.sourceforge.net. This port has a lot of enhancements, fixes, and other features not present in the DOS original, and is superior in almost every way. Save for the fact that it won't be as high on the nostalgia scale for some people because of all of this. As for physical copies, they're pretty hard to come by, but not excessively expensive when you do find them, as the demand for them isn't actually all that high. The DOS version tends to go for around $20 to $30 fully boxed, or you can also sometimes find loose copies of Collection CD, which includes both the original and second game, for around the same price. Amazingly, the 3DO version is exceedingly rare for whatever reason. But again, limited demand, so because of that, the prices are all over the place when you do find it. Save for Japanese import copies, which are pretty cheap and fairly common for whatever reason. But given the options for playing this game nowadays though, the only reason you would want a physical copy is for sake of collecting. Also, keep in mind that the game has manual-based copy protection in DOS, so if you intend to play a physical copy, make sure you have the manual too. The backstory for Star Control 2 is immense. I don't think there's any way I can convey the whole thing in a concise way, so I'm just going to talk about the same things the game itself brings up when you first start it up. But rest assured, there's far more depth to it than what I'm about to say. The story starts by telling of a war between the Alliance of Free Stars and the Urquan Hierarchy. The Alliance was made up of several races from across the galaxy, including Earth, all with the dream of being able to explore space and conduct trade freely and without fear while the Urquan race is dedicated to the enslavement of other races to perpetuate their war machine. Unfortunately for the Alliance, the Urquan were winning. However, while this war was raging on, an expedition on the edge of the known frontier uncovered an amazing discovery far beneath the surface of an alien world. A huge underground city belonging to a race known only as the Precursors, who haven't been seen in countless thousands of years. Before this discovery could be reported though, the Urquan had broken through the Alliance's main defensive line and all contacts with the Alliance were swiftly cut, leaving the explorers stranded. But once all hope for a rescue had been lost, the explorers proceeded to colonize the planet and learn more about the technology left behind by the Precursors. Over the course of the next 20 years, they figured out that what they thought was an underground city was actually much, much more. It was a massive factory for building starships. Given the lack of resources available on the planet, and the limited number of colonists able to command a ship in the first place, the factory wasn't able to put together anything more than the most basic of precursor ships. The design they settled on was made to be a workhorse, easily modifiable for whatever situations it needed to be sent into, 
but on its own, without modifications, be very basic and little more than a giant floating target. Still, it would be more than enough to at least get the survivors back to Earth to discover what was going on, and if necessary, form new alliances to once again continue the fight against the Urquan. The game actually starts proper at this point, but immediately at the beginning you discover Earth has been encased in an Urquan slave shield, with the people below being forced to live with minimal technology and toil to produce basic resources for the Urquan to appropriate. Now you come to a space station meant to resupply Urquan vessels and discover that the Earth people on board live in fear of rebelling against their Urquan masters, since it would mean all of their deaths if they stepped out of line even only a little. But with the Urquan seemingly busy with other matters in the universe and the guards put in charge having all but fled for their own purposes, the commander of the station agrees to help you out and so begins your journey into the unknown. I'm just gonna get this out of the way right now. The battle system in Star Control 2 is virtually identical to the battle system in the original Star Control, and since I've already talked about that game, I'm mostly gonna be focusing on the non-combat portions of this game. Now, when you start a new game, you're actually given the option to name yourself and your ship. While there's no default name for the ship in the DOS version, the 3DO version gives it the default name Vindicator. The main goal of the game is to defeat the Urquan, but this is far easier said than done for a couple of reasons. The first is that their space is vast and so are their numbers. Thus, without support from other alien races and tons of resources to build ships and equipment with, there's no way you could survive a confrontation with them. The other more pertinent reason is that you can't actually go after any homeworlds in this game. If you attempt to launch an attack against an alien homeworld, you're just going to have an infinite number of opponents to deal with. Though I should clarify, the final target in this game is actually a ship, not a homeworld, but I digress. So, first things first. You need resources. At the side of the screen, at all times, outside of combat, you can see an overview of your status, including your flagship's loadout, escort fighters, fuel available, crew available, but when you're docked at the starbase, you also see your resource units, or RU. You can get more RU in three different ways. The first and most obvious way is to scour planets for raw materials. The raw materials come in a huge array of possibilities, but each one ultimately belongs to one of eight groups. Those groups, in order of least to most valuable, are commons, corrosives, basic metals, noble gases, rare earths, precious metals, radioactives, and exotics. When you offload these with the commander of the starbase, they become RU for you to spend. The second way to get RU is salvage. Whenever you engage an enemy in combat and win, you can salvage the wreckage for a fixed number of RU, depending on what kinds of ships you fought and how many. And keep in mind that the value of the salvage for a ship does not tie in with how powerful it is. So keep this in mind when deciding to grind resources this way as opposed to exploring planets. Now, there is a third way to legitimately get RU, but it's kind of a tricky one, so I'm not going to reveal it just yet. Since landing on planets is such a big part of the game, this is one aspect you'd think would have been done extraordinarily well. But I find it's actually the weakest aspect of the whole experience. Not that it's bad, but it could have been done far better. Let's start with how it actually works. When you're exploring a star system, you simply move up to a planet and touch it, and you'll enter orbit. From here, you can scan the planet to get basic information, then do further scans to identify minerals, energy sources, and potential life forms. Well, the menu selection is labeled biological, but it can detect machines too in the extremely rare instances when this happens. If you're satisfied with the scans, you can then dispatch a lander and scout around. However, before you decide to land, it's crucial that you pay attention to all of your scan data, as making a landing may not be in your best interests. The four stats you want to be absolutely sure to keep your eyes on are gravity, temperature, weather, and tectonics. The gravity will determine how much fuel is consumed per trip to the surface. 1g is equal to about two full units of fuel which in turn is equal to 40 resource units, as one unit of fuel costs 20 resource units to acquire. Additional crew members also cost 3 RU at the start of the game, and the landers themselves are 500 RU each. So if the cost to land on the planet exceeds what you're liable to get back from trading in what you find, it's generally not worth the trouble. 
Gravity is only one piece of the puzzle, though. If the temperature is in excess of 100 degrees Celsius, you'll have to deal with firestorms raging across the surface. These firestorms will rip through the lander in a split second if you're not careful, and they're extremely difficult to dodge. However, I find that until the surface temp passes about 500 to 600 C, you should be okay, so long as you've got the driving down and don't waste any time. The weather is a bit more damning. There can either be none or eight classes of severity. Class 1 and 2 mean nothing, so you can safely land in those cases. Class 3 and 4 indicate minor amounts of lightning to deal with, and since you can't exactly dodge lightning, you're liable to lose between 3 and 4 crew per trip, so you have to factor this into if it's worth the effort or not. Class 5 and 6 weather will have substantial storms and will force you to make your trips very brief. Class 7 and 8 weather is virtually impossible to survive without special lander upgrades, so don't even think about attempting it until you get said upgrades. As for tectonics, similar rules apply as with the weather. Class 1 and 2 tectonics have no effect. Class 3 and 4 are mostly harmless, but you do have to keep watch for earthquakes and dodge them if you see the points where they're going to strike, as an earthquake can easily kill off many crew members. Class 5 and 6 are possible to handle without upgrades, but you got to be very careful, while Class 7 and 8 are just death traps under most circumstances. However, there is a bit of a trick to dealing with all tectonics, in that the second tech upgrade you get in this game is the speed upgrade for your landers. Now, earthquakes can only spawn nearby your lander, meaning that so long as you keep moving very quickly and never spend more than a split second in one spot, you'll actually dodge almost every earthquake, and the ones which do hit will only make contact long enough to kill one or two crew members. Once you make the decision to land, up to 12 crew members will board the lander, depending on how many are available on your flagship, and will land where you tell them to. Roughly. The actual landing coordinate will almost always be off slightly, and the direction you're facing will be random. This is to prevent players from doing touch and go to collect resources without consequence, since the moment you press spacebar, you immediately take back off from the planet and return to the flagship. Now, all of this sounds really freaking cool, to have all these considerations and everything. The actual landing gameplay takes place in a tiny square in the bottom right corner with twitchy controls and barely any room to see anything. This is why I called this part of the gameplay weak. Compare this to the combat in this game, the numerous conversation trees, or even the landing mechanics in Starflight, and this really is the most subpar mechanic of all of that. Once you've landed, there's no additional scanning to do, no extra weapons to use, no considerations outside of hostile factors. Heck, not even the surface itself is an obstacle. Whatever looks like water or lava or acid or mountains, all of it is just flat land. But you better get used to this, because until you have the combat system mastered and a fleet of ships to support doing battle in the first place, this is the safest and best way to get resource units. However, even if you prefer combat, you're going to have to land on planets anyways, because it's the only way to get biological data. By shooting down biological entities with your stunner, they become data packets you can take with you. Biological data can then be sold to an alien race known as the Melnorme, in exchange for their own units of currency, which can then be exchanged for things such as fuel, information, but most importantly, the tech upgrades. Not just for your lander, but for new equipment to build for your flagship. Now let's talk about communicating with alien races, cause you're gonna be doing a lot of this too. Whenever you enter an encounter state, you're shown the ships you'll be facing, and are given the option to converse or attack. In some instances, you're gonna be stuck entering combat no matter what, but even then, conversing first is often a good idea. The conversation system shows you an image of who you're conversing with, and presents you with options for how to respond. Now, unlike Starflight and other similar space exploration games which greatly limit your conversation options, the conversations in Star Control 2 are highly unique and varied between every encounter, and sometimes the results of each option changes depending on what other options you've used either during the current conversation or in past conversations with similar encounters. In fact, conversing with your enemies prior to combat is often a good way to find out information you otherwise wouldn't have, even if it takes more multiple battles. But you can also greatly affect the outcome of the game based on your choices too. The entire galaxy is in a fluid state of existence, and while your actions will have a definite effect on how things play out, 
Believe it or not, there's other factors going on at the same time, many of which you won't even realize are happening until after they happen, or unless you uncover info about it from various sources, thus encouraging repeat playthroughs to try and affect those outcomes. The most important thing of all, though, is that you're ultimately in a race against the clock. A piece of advice you're ultimately given by the Melnorme is that they've predicted that horrible things will happen shortly into the start of 2159, roughly four in-game years from the start of the game. A particular alien race will be on the move following this point, leaving a trail of total destruction in its wake, and they will reach Earth just months following this point in time if you don't find a way to stop them. There are ways to delay this event, but sooner or later it will take place and the game will effectively be over, so you need to be diligent and waste as little time as possible if you want to win. I will say though that winning on your very first playthrough is very unlikely because of the sheer number of things you could be doing in contrast to which of those things will actually advance the plot towards a successful conclusion. The last thing to mention about the gameplay directly is that, in order to get between solar systems, you have to travel through hyperspace. You enter hyperspace simply by flying out of a solar system. Fuel usage in hyperspace is very high, so trying to maneuver around in it manually is not really recommended, unless you're trying to find your way into star systems which aren't normally accessible from the star map due to their proximity with other more prominent systems. To use the autopilot, all you have to do is select a system on the star map with the enter key, and when you return to navigating, the autopilot will activate. Though you can take manual control again in a split second simply by pressing any directional key. The star map also shows a light shaded circle to indicate your present range given how much fuel you have. Personally, I've always felt there should be two circles. One to show maximum range, but also one to show halfway, since going beyond half of your range from Earth means you won't be able to get back there without Melnorme assistance. I may fail at playing this thing more than I should, but I do have some useful tips and tricks to help you all out. And the first big one is to never forget about gas giants. Since you can't land on gas giants, let alone find anything, you may be tempted to skip on visiting them when in a solar system. But don't forget that planets in this game can have up to four moons present, so even gas giants are worth checking out just in case they have some moons you could explore. My next tip is to not rely on your escape warp. Your flagship is equipped with a device early on to allow you to escape from combat back into whatever area you were in. Now this works fine if there's only one group of hostiles pestering you, but when there's two or more, only the last one you encountered will be avoidable following your escape meaning you'll instantly enter an encounter with a different one. It's generally a good idea to save before making any long hyperspace voyages, and if you end up fighting different battles that you can't win and subsequently can't escape from because they're all bunched together, just reload and try your luck elsewhere. Another huge tip is in regards to how to find the Melnorme to sell biological data and buy the tech upgrades. Now for some reason, the Melnorme love to hang around the brightest and most powerful stars, and prefer to frequent the gas giants in those solar systems. So, simply look for the brightest stars on your map and plot a course for the nearest one, then check all the gas giants inside. However, there is a catch to this trick. As far as I can tell, the Melnorme never appear in the same system twice in a row, so try to keep in mind where you last met up with them so as not to accidentally go back there when trying to search for them. Speaking of the Melnorme, I mentioned a third way to generate resource units. If you somehow manage to amass a lot of extra biological data and are in desperate need of resource units, one thing you can do is purchase fuel for credits from the Melnorme, go back to the starbase, and trade in the excess fuel for resource units at 20 RU per fuel unit. Given that a full tank fuel amounts to 1000 RU, this can add up surprisingly quickly. However, since the lander upgrades are essential for surviving the more hostile planetary environments, and you don't get the two best ones until near the end of the upgrade sequence, it's probably better to save your credits for those. That's something important to keep in mind too, is that resource units always buy and sell at an equal value. Thus, if you want to try a particular configuration of equipment out, you can do so without consequence, since if you don't like the way it works out, you can just trade in some components and get some others in turn. Or just get some more fuel or some more crew members. Speaking of crew members, the game is supposedly tracking a limited number of them on the starbase, and it'll jump the cost to train more crew if you take away too many. Now, I've never seen this happen, so if anyone knows any details about this, 
it'd be appreciated, but it's something to keep in mind that crew members may not be infinitely replaceable. My last tip has to do with the conversation system. The conversation system in this game is not like a typical conversation system, where you just pick everything you can until you're done. Certain options can have major consequences, even when they seem completely innocuous, which is part of the beauty of it. Just remember to be diplomatic most of the time and pander to your contact's desires to get the most out of them and you should be fine. Even when facing hostiles, try to reason with them because you may be surprised at what you might learn. Before I give my overall opinion of Star Control 2, I want to quickly mention a couple things which have followed since. There was indeed a sequel, Star Control 3, which a lot of people give a lot of flack for for some reason, possibly the fact that it really lacks the charm and colorful design Star Control 2 had. But keep in mind the third game in the series came out in the mid-90s when gaming was shifting towards making things look more real. And if you set aside the drastically different presentation, the formula is pretty much the same as always. Mind you, even the music took a notable hit in quality, and I maintain that music is surprisingly important to the longevity of your title. However, the more interesting thing I want to bring up is that there's a new Star Control game in the works right now. It's being developed by Stardock Entertainment, a fairly prevalent game developer that's been around since the 90s, which has worked on numerous titles over the years, either primarily or as an external partner. They're touting their new Star Control game to be the biggest project they've ever worked on by far, and given some of the games they've made, that's saying a lot. Other than that, they haven't really let much info out. About the only things they have said is that the game's going to take place in its own universe, so as not to interfere with the canon of the first three games, and they want to do something to commemorate the game's 25th anniversary next year in November. So for any of you who've been yearning for a brand new Star Control game for a while now, your wish will be coming true soon. Overall, Star Control 2 is a decent space exploration game with a lot of elements to it. But save for the battle engine, which is extremely well done, the rest of it kind of reminds me of Sid Meier's covert action rule, where it's better to make one good game than two great games. It often feels like the different pieces of this game clash with each other even though each works well enough in its own right. And I also can't shake the feeling about how Starflight did the planetary landing sequences far better. It doesn't help that I can never get anywhere in this thing either, and for me personally, I feel it's because of how twitchy the gameplay can get at times, with split-second incorrect decisions completely costing you the game even though you're still minutes away from an actual game over. Well, that's not a problem with the game, it's just the way it is, and players who can adapt to that will be able to get a lot further in this thing than I ever could. Besides, I still enjoy the presentation and the extreme level of detail and care which went into crafting this game's universe. Basically, it's a game worth trying for anyone with even a remote interest in space exploration games. Chances are high you'll enjoy this game more than I do. But if you've played Starflight or other space exploration games before and couldn't stand them, then there's a pretty good chance you won't be able to stand this one either. As for running this game in DOSBox, you need to set a fixed cycles count, otherwise it won't boot up properly. I recommend a cycle setting of 20,000, however it's probably better to just play the Urquan Masters port instead of the original DOS version, unless you're in it primarily for the nostalgia of playing the very original game. Especially considering that the Urquan Masters is freeware and Star Control 2 is not. The game also has joystick support, but because of how twitchy the controls are, I recommend skipping on it in favor of keyboard controls. Though when playing Super Melee with two players, someone really should use a joystick or gamepad to free up the keyboard buffer for whoever uses it to prevent key conflicts. So that's all for the 200th episode of Ancient DOS Games. Thanks to all of you for sticking with me for this long and continuing to watch my crazy little show. Or if you're brand new to this series, thanks for giving it a chance and I hope you stick around. Thanks to all of you who are helping to support the show by spreading the word about it through your social media accounts, through your own channels, or however. And special thanks to those of you who are helping to support the show on Patreon. All of you guys are awesome. There'll still be some filler videos to fill out the year, and Shovelware Diggers will continue as usual, but as for Season 5 of Ancient DOS Games, <laughs> presuming we survived this little excursion, it'll begin on Saturday, January 7th, 2017. I have to admit, I never thought- Sorry to disturb you, Captain, but we'll be ready to leave orbit any minute now.
Thanks, Lieutenant. Well, you heard him. It's time for me to do my duty. Catch y'all later. Captain, final checks are complete and we're ready to get underway. Thanks, Commander. Helmsman? Sir? Plot course for the edge of the solar system and prepare to enter hyperspace. We've got a galaxy to save. Aye, sir. Taking us out.